Good evening, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Beyond the Guidelines. As tonight, we talk about the management of ER-positive metastatic breast cancer. We have a great faculty uh, here on this stage, and each one of them will be giving a presentation. Uh, here are disclosures uh, of the faculty, and in addition to that, uh, I actually uh, spent uh, quite a bit of time over the last few weeks uh, talking to six other investigators, and we uh, recorded those conversations. We'll be integrating those throughout uh, this program, and as well as uh, tomorrow night and uh, Thursday night here in the same room. As we always do, we will be talking about uh, out-of-label indications. We're really going to focus on risk-benefit uh, perceptions uh, and data. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we'll be back tomorrow night talking about localized uh, HER2-negative breast cancer, uh, IOs uh, in the uh, neoadjuvant setting, and much uh, more, uh, adjuvant uh, CDK. And then on Thursday, uh, we'll be doing a program again in this room here on HER2 uh, low disease, a topic of great interest. And then on Friday, for those of your colleagues who are over at the ASH meeting in uh, San Diego and for everybody else who's online, we'll be doing four meetings uh, at the uh, annual ASH meeting on uh, follicular lymphoma, uh, Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, diffuse large B cell, so much going on there, CLL, and uh, as well, we'll finish out uh, Friday night with uh, multiple myeloma, so check that out as well. And come and visit us uh, next March in Miami. We're gonna reawaken our weekend long, long general medical oncology uh, program, uh, and we'll be talking about about 20, 25 different tumor types. Uh, for the uh, attendees here in the room, on the iPads, all the slides are there. There's a survey for you to take. Uh, and if you have any questions or cases you'd like to run by us, you can do that on the iPad and also uh, do the evaluation. For our colleagues who are watching online, first, hi, it's been great uh, working with you all this uh, past year. <coughs> uh, and all these same features are available in the chat room uh, as well. We are recording all of these meetings and we'll send you out an email uh, when this is uh, put together uh, as, as an enduring uh, series of programs uh, for people to enjoy. Uh, here's where we're heading, uh, what we're gonna talk about uh, tonight. Uh, we'll start out talking about CDK in the first line setting and really spend the rest of the time talking about second line and beyond and the many things that are going on now. Uh, we actually did a survey over the last couple weeks of our faculty for all three of these meetings and, uh, as well as some additional investigators including the docs that I interviewed and you'll see the results of that survey uh, as we proceed uh, here tonight. But this is the other faculty uh, six investigators we're all uh, well aware of and work with quite a bit. We wanted to try to squeeze them in. We, we, over the last three years, with the evolution of uh, you know, uh, uh, teleconferencing and being able to edit and bring these uh, things into live venues, we kind of created our own, so we call it TikTok. So you're going to see a bunch of 90 second or less videos tonight from these investigators. We just want to recreate what happens on rounds. When we ask them, you know, we ask your attending, you know, what about this? What do you do in this situation? Just what they say. I want to pick their, I pick their brains. I want to see what our faculty has to say about what they have to say. Just a couple words before we get started. Uh, first, uh, and of course, we're thrilled to have uh, Virginia here today who runs the meeting. But you probably know, Virginia, that I think it was well, I know it was somewhere around here 20 years ago, the attack trial was in this hotel, mm -hmm. somewhere around here, Michael Baum presented it. Uh, so now it's the 20th anniversary. <laughs> you may remember the attack trial uh, showing that uh, the uh, Nastrozole AI is a little better than tamoxifen, but the thing everybody really wanted to see was the tamoxifen and the Nastrozole. Everybody was thinking maybe that would be better. Well, it wasn't, but here we are 20 years later. Think about what we're talking about here tonight the whole concept of adding on to hormonal therapy. Uh, we're really looking forward to seeing uh, more data from the Monarch uh, series of studies, uh, particularly survival that we're gonna talk a lot about. And I heard a really uh, interesting story in the, uh, in the faculty room. I always learn so much when I meet with the faculty ahead of time. I heard a great story about this press release that came out I think on Tuesday, and somehow Virginia decided that she was gonna get it presented this Friday like the world's record, and Kamal is actually going to do the presentation on Friday. Virginia, anything you want to share about uh, your uh, championship uh, effort here to get this data triplet 
<laughs> Can you imagine? Think about the attack trial. Now we're talking about, you know, CDK, uh, AI, and Alpalisib, first-line therapy. Uh, any, uh, anything you want to say about uh, bringing that to us here now as opposed to wait until ASCA, Virginia? Well, so, so this is uh, teamwork. Uh, I, I, I texted this morning when I saw the press release a few people, including Hope, and Hope responded right away and said, let me see what I can do. <laughs> and then we all connected with the right people, and we were lucky. And, and ultimately, it's the patients that are going to benefit, because instead of waiting six months to see the data, we're going to see it on Friday. So it's important to see how these drugs, uh, what, what adverse events they have, what the benefit is, and figure out how we can incorporate them in our patient care. So Kamal, I'm sure you've been busy enough getting ready for San Antonio to all of a sudden have to do a completely new uh, <laughs> breakthrough uh, uh, presentation here. Anything you want to say about what it's been like? And also, maybe just a little bit of a hint. One of the things I wasn't aware of from this were the patients who got in there, because this is not like all comers, right? Yes, that's absolutely correct. It is uh, definitely exciting and one of, its, uh, one of its kind opportunity, I guess. But I think, as Virginia said, I think if you see some uh, data with positive results, I think it's a good idea to not hold on and wait to present it at a future meeting. But yeah, as you said, this is with a drug, a PI3K alpha-specific uh, PI3K inhibitor called Inavolisib. And this is looking at the triplet combination of inavolisib with fulvestrant and palvociclib compared to fulvestrant, placebo, and palvociclib in a patient population that recurs on or within 12 months of endocrine therapy and is found to have big 3 ca mutated tumor and are treatment naive in the metastatic setting. So a very distinct patient population here. So I've heard a lot of stories over the last couple of years about using alpalisib, and if this, uh, this uh, agent is similar to that, I imagine it's going to be interesting to do it as part of a triplet, so I'm sure everybody's going to be very interested in the toxicity data as well. Well, that's just a little bit of a prelude, uh, but let's get down to the nitty-gritty about what we want to try to cover here today. We're going to ta start out talking about first-line therapy and uh, the use of CDK inhibitors, something we've been talking about for quite a while. Here are some of the findings uh, from our survey. You know, the reason we call this Beyond the Guidelines is because, you know, the guidelines will present a number of evidence-based options. We like to go to a bunch of investigators and say, like, what do you do? And if all of them do the same thing, well, we call that a consensus. If there's a little bit of a mix, like you start to see a little one here, then, you know, you get a little more granularity about how people are making these decisions. So this is a question I've been asking for a long time. Here are the current answers. I wouldn't be surprised if they had changed by Friday, incidentally, but maybe not, who knows. So first-line therapy, premenopausal women, this is just a prelude. I want you to listen to our, our other faculty members talking about how they think it through, and then we'll hear about from our faculty. So premenopausal, most but not everybody says ribo. Uh, Postmenopausal, most but not everybody says ribo in terms of what they prefer. Of course, we know individually, you know, and people may make different decisions. We said you've got a postmenopausal woman who presents with metastatic ER-positive disease. Everybody will give AI plus CDK, again, uh, mainly uh, 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 ribo. Uh, then the scenario of a patient uh, who develops metastatic disease kind of may be similar you know, in the direction of the people that uh, you just discussed, Kamal, in your trial you know, earlier, you know, two years, years or, or even earlier. Uh, obviously, most people are thinking about full vestrant, but again, most common CDK in that situation being uh, ribo. We also asked another question we've been asking for a while, what about rechallenge? But now the issue of rechallenge with the CDK is much different because now we're seeing it in the adjuvant setting. So maybe you're going to see patients, well, you will see patients who have had time off CDK before they relapse. Would you repeat it? And actually, the survey participants most would repeat, usually within a year. Okay, let's uh, get a little bit of uh, rounds here and see what some of our colleagues think about their preferred uh, first-line CDK. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm going to ask Virginia to comment on this. Uh, let's play the video. Based on the available data in terms of survival and analysis, I favor either RIBO or ABIMA for patients starting out new and the endocrine partner will depend on how far they are from their prior AI or whether they've been on AI. And between the two, sometimes it comes down to what their other comorbid conditions are and other issues. People with GI issues tend to go with ribo. Somebody's on a couple of heart meds and a bunch of other stuff and don't want to mess with EKGs, you go with the BIMA. But it's nice to have choices for our patients. 
once the overall survival data came out with ribocyclin, particularly in some of the trials looking at premenopausal women exclusively, I've sort of started going to that as my go-to CDK4-6 inhibitor for most of my premenopausal patients and some of my postmenopausal patients as well. So bemocyclin tends to be less hard on the bone marrow than the other two drugs. But I've had patients, for example, with you know, either long histories of alcohol use and their bone marrow never quite recovered, where bemocyclin feels like a better option. And then with ribocyclin, sometimes the LFT abnormalities and the QTC interval can be challenging to manage with ribocyclin in patients with lots of concomitant medications or other medical issues. So those are patients where I will sometimes turn to palpocyclib as well. My favorite CDK46 inhibitors is ribocyclib, irrespective of menopausal status. And in general, we're seeing so many negative trials with palbocyclib. And instead, we're seeing so many positive trials with ribo and abema, both in the metastatic setting, but also now in the adjuvant setting. So again, Virginia, I learned so much in the faculty room. And one of the things that you all were talking about was this, quote, negative trial that the press release came out with the Monarch study. But yet the absolute numbers that you all were saying look really good. Maybe it was a smaller study that didn't have the power can you comment a little bit, first of all, on what uh, Dr. Sharma was commenting on in general, and also, you know, maybe I just want to kind of tease out from all of you, what does all this survival mean? Does it trump out some of the clinical issues that uh, the faculty was discussing? Virginia? I, I think it's extremely important that we have options, because not one drug is going to be the best drug for every single patient we have. And in my experience, palpocyclib is the easiest one to tolerate. You don't have to get LFTs. You don't have to be, actually you do, but not as often as as with RIBO, you don't have to be checking EKGs, but that's the one that doesn't have overall survival data. But it has the primary endpoint, which was met, and it was met with all of these three drugs in all of the trials that were done in the metastatic setting. And that's important for us to remember that a lot of this is statistical games. How do we design the trial? How many patients can we afford to put on the trial? And ultimately, what's the patient population that's included in the trial after we've designed it? So all of that could be luck. We've all decided that a p-value of 0.05 is important. That means 5% chance of an error. Well, how about a 5.1% chance of an error? Is that not good enough? So we have to take all of this into account as far as the absolute benefit and decide if that absolute benefit makes a difference. We've had drugs approved, thankfully not in breast cancer, but in pancreatic cancer with a two-week overall survival benefit. And nobody used the drugs because ultimately they were not clinically useful. Eric, I'm curious whether you think there's like a biologic basis that maybe one might be more effective than the other. This problem comes up in oncology all the time. Multiple agents available in the same class. They don't have the exact same toxicity. Does it make sense that RIBO would be better or is it maybe more what Virginia was saying about the trials? I mean, I don't, I don't think any of us originally predicted that, right? Progression-free survival, the hazard ratios across all three, I mean, they were identical, right? They were 0.55. Um, you know, I, I agree, you know, it, a bimacyclib, you know, clearly seems to favor um, in overall survival. It's not statistically significant. Palbocyclib was really just negative in terms of overall survival. You know, does that mean that I don't think it's appropriate for anyone to ever be on palbocyclib? No. Um, but the reality is, is we have three choices. And so when I'm starting somebody newly on a CDK, it's hard for me to argue. I think you should really be on this one if it doesn't have overall survival and we have a choice that does, right? Cabell, any uh, thoughts? So, you know, I think one of the themes I'm seeing across oncology, a lot of discussion at ASCO and breast, is kind of keeping people on therapy and doing dose reductions if necessary, and really aggressively trying to follow patients, particularly on long-term targeted therapy where you see toxicity. Again, aggressively reducing doses. How does that actually play out in your practice in metastatic disease? And what are some of the clinical issues you deal with with these different agents? Yeah, no, I, I think I'll just make one more additional comment to what you were discussing with Virginia and Erica about overall survival not being the primary endpoint across these trials. So they were powered for the primary endpoint, which was progression-free survival, and I think we need to remember that. But I completely agree with Erica that when you have a new patient starting in clinic, how do you not offer an agent that has consistently shown it regardless? Uh, and to your point, I think we have been uh, successful in dose reducing, and in fact, we have data for some of these agents where we've looked at with dose reductions, there's no impact or detrimental impact to efficacy. And so certainly we've been, you know, I think we need to be very cognizant about the unique side effects of each. 
We need to educate our patients up front about what they could expect so that they can report if they're feeling some subjective symptoms that can be brought to our attention. For example, diarrhea is something we see with abemaciclib. And I'm sure that if we were to educate our patients to prompt us about this, tell them what supportive care they need to take, when to start antidiarrheals, and when we should consider dose reductions, that that would have a major impact on how they stay on drug for a long time. The others are lab abnormalities, but the good news is even with dose reductions on CDK4-6, the efficacy is maintained. So Hope, I'd like you to respond to some of the comments from Dr. Zabrowski and uh, Mizell. There are cell culture models that when they become resistant to CDK, you withdraw the CDK and then you retreat those cell cultures with CDK like nine months later or something and they respond. So that's kind of interesting and kind of hopefully will be applicable to this scenario. I have not had anybody yet who's been on a CDK like Abema yet in the adjuvant setting and has progressed, but there will be them because generally these are the high-risk patients that we're going to treat. I think that what I probably will do is if it's been more than a year since the completion of their CDK4, I'll probably re-challenge them with a CDK4. Which one? The same one, a different one? I don't know the answer to that with a different anti-hormonal therapy. If they have done really well and they've been on their frontline AI and CDK4-6 inhibitor for a long period of time, I might take the data from the maintained trial, especially if they started on Palbo and use Lovestrin and Ribocyclob in second line. Hope, any thoughts? You know, I think that um, these are really important comments because the CDK4-6 inhibitors overall are among the best targeted, best tolerated targeted agents we have in combination with endocrine therapy. And we don't like to give endocrine therapy alone anymore, which is a huge sort of change in our thinking about uh, how we're treating patients with metastatic disease. But we don't know that CDK after CDK works. Uh, the maintained trial was a phase two trial with very, I think, exciting results, but we're waiting for post-monarch, which is a more homogeneous population, a phase three trial where abemaciclib is given in the second line setting with a change in endocrine therapy to really understand if that's the right thing to do. Otherwise, we do have a, a seemingly increasing number of targeted agents that we can give. Uh, recently approved the AKT inhibitor Capivacertib for patients with abnormalities of the AKT P10 P3 kinase pathway. We have Alpelisib, albeit more difficult to manage the toxicities, Everolimus, which appears to be pathway change agnostic, um, and then a whole host of new endocrine agents that we're using with Elicestrin to prove for ESR1 mutant disease. So I think that Right now, when I'm thinking about this situation, you know, I'm really thinking about what other information I can bring into the decision about the next best treatment for a patient uh, so that we can optimize uh, our ability to overcome endocrine resistance. That's not saying that we won't be using CDK after CDK in the future for patients with lower burden disease, but I think that right now it really is a specific patient with very low burden disease where you might consider doing that without additional evidence. Francois? Yes, yeah, so um, two, two comments. I think that we also have, we'll also have soon another trial, which is MBES-3. And MBES-3 is a trial that is testing uh, in the uh, second line setting. So, um, and one arm is Fulvestran single agent, the second arm is Immunestran single agent, but we have a third arm that is Immunestran plus Abima. So, and this trial is supposed to be to read out um, almost at the same time as post-monarch, I think. So we'll have two phase three trials that are testing uh, abemacitly post-CDK, post-progression after CDK, uh, first line CDK46. So, so we are currently building, and I think that next year or even like in the next seven months, let's say, uh, we'll have much more evidence maybe in favor of using Abima because these two trials are with Abima after uh, a CDK. And the second remark is about um, the trial that just read out in Avolizid. So uh, this trial is building on, so it's Fulvestran plus Palbocetlib plus in Avolizib. So it's uh, for patients with pix 3 c mutation, which account for about 40% of this ER plus um, metastatic breast cancer. And I think that we, we have to see the data, especially related to the toxicity, but um, we really need, you know, this kind of treatment could be very handy in the context of we don't trust so much, you know, patient relapsing after CDK4-6 inhibitor given the adjuvant setting, so we could re-challenge with CDK4-6, but adding something else such as inavolis, it could be um, very welcome in this setting. I will say we're going to introduce some of the most interesting uh, 
biomarker uh, algorithmic slides we've ever used in any cancer uh, in terms of second line endocrine therapy of breast cancer. Now we have three variables as of two weeks ago, right? So we've already had ESR1 uh, that we've been uh, looking at, uh, pick three of course, but now we've got AKT and P10. We're gonna talk about that and hopefully you already started educating me in the faculty room, but there's a lot more to go. Things changed a lot two weeks ago. But let's get back to the issue of first line CDK. Virginia, let's talk about the data. Absolutely. So this is a summary uh, table on all of the clinical trials with uh, uh, CDK46 inhibitors. And you can see that the Paloma trials did not meet overall survival uh, positive results. When we look at the Mona Lisa trials, all three of the Mona Lisa trials met the overall survival endpoint. Uh, and, and, and just a reminder, the Mona Lisa 7 was in a purely premenopausal patient population. And then the Monarch 2, which was a second, third line setting trial, met OS and then uh, the Monarch 3, which is going to get presented tomorrow at the SABCS, I want you to pay attention not just to the uh, p-value, but also the absolute difference in overall survival between these arms, because I think that's extremely important. So the question is, um, do we, first of all, what is the side effect profile? Are all these three CDKs the same? And we've discussed this, and this is a nice table looking at uh, ribocyclib and looking at palbocyclib and then abemocyclib. And you can see the difference as far as uh, cytopenias with palbo and ribo, diarrhea as far as abemocyclib. And this looks at uh, all the, the different clinical trials that were done, just a summary of these adverse events. And just also a reminder that abemocyclib has an, an, an increase in uh, venous thromboembolic events and ribo has an acute prolongation that we just at least clinically have to be getting a couple of VKGs, technically three. So um, one of the first questions is, do we, do, does every patient need a CDK46 inhibitor in the first line setting? And we all were a little skeptical about that, but the data was just so impressive. But the Sonia trial that was presented at ASCO earlier this year looked at this question and looked at sequencing. Patients received CDK46 inhibitor in the first line setting at progression, full vestrant, or started with, a, uh, with an AI, and then at progression received full vestrant and a CDK46 inhibitor. And what you can see is that the primary, en the primary endpoint of PFS2, which was PFS at that second progression where every patient received a CDK46 inhibitor, either in the first or second line setting, was identical pretty much between the two, the two arms, <laughs> suggesting that some patients, maybe not all, but some patients may be okay by just getting an aromatase inhibitor in that first line setting and followed by a CDK46 inhibitor in the second line setting. Now, we typically don't do this in, in, in clinical trials, and this is the overall survival data, again, suggesting no difference, but this is early, and again, the trial was not powered for overall survival. So what do we usually do? Well, we start with the CDK46 inhibitor, and then the, 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 one of the questions that we try to answer, especially in the patients that have very high burden of disease and almost a visceral crisis is, can we just give a CDK46 inhibitor or should we give them chemotherapy? And this is the right choice trial that really included very high risk patients. And you can see here symptomatic visceral met 67% of the patients, visceral crisis half of the patients, visceral met 78%. And this trial compared ribo and endocrine therapy to doublet chemotherapy. And, and, and I think it was impressive that ribo actually did better than, than doublet chemotherapy. So this gave us the reassurance <laughs> that we should forget about chemotherapy in that first line HR positive metastatic setting. And I think this, this is, a, again, another impressive trial. Uh, kudos to our colleagues in the, um, uh, in the, in the Far East for, for doing the trial. So we've talked here about sequencing CDK46 inhibitors, and we have three trials. One is the, the PACE trial, one arm looking at uh, palbocyclib as a single agent, and then uh, the other arms look, I'm sorry, fulvestrin as a single agent, then doublet, and then finally a, 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 an arm with avelumab, immunotherapy. And the reason for that was the fact that there's some data that after progression, or one of the reasons of progressions of CDK46 inhibitor is an increase in, in immune therapy biomarkers. And so maybe an immune, re, uh, um, and immune agent might actually be beneficial. And this is a small trial, but this was a palbo after palbo trial. And as you can see, the only arm that may have benefited was the one that included avelumab. 
but the palbo after palbo arm really did not seem to benefit. A similar trial in the Palmyra trial, but this was a truly a palbo after palbo trial, was also negative, suggesting that if we want to sequence our CDK4-6 inhibitors, we actually have to switch from one to the other. And then finally, the maintained trial that was discussed earlier today, suggesting that if we switch from palbocyclib, and most of the patients receive palbocyclib, not all, to ribocyclib, we may actually get a benefit in improvement in progression-free survival. All of these are phase two uh, <coughs> clinical trials. We need to wait for the phase three trials, most of the, mo mostly the post-monarch. I think we're probably six months away from, uh, from data release from that trial. So it'll be interesting because that is a question that we all uh, want an answer to. So this is the post-monarch trial, phase three trial, uh, relatively good sample size. So hopefully that'll <coughs> answer the question of whether we can give a bemacyclib after uh, <clears throat> CDK4-6 inhibitor, which uh, included uh, a bemacyclib as well. So as a conclusion, I think first-line uh, therapy with CDK4-6 inhibitor should really be considered standard of care in the majority of patients, although we could potentially give in our much lower-risk patients endocrine therapy, uh, monotherapy, and then in that second line, give them a CDK4-6 inhibitor. And then as far as giving a CDK after a CDK, I personally would wait until we have data from the post-monarch trial. But now with the generation of, of, of data with other agents, with looking at other pathways, this is becoming a very crowded field. Thanks a lot, Virginia. We're going to move on uh, and really dive into a second line uh, endocrine uh, therapy uh, and particularly what looks like a new algorithm in uh, medical oncology and breast cancer uh, specifically. Um, so here we go. Uh, we're going to look at a bunch of variables. Here's the clinical scenario. And uh, Kamal, I'm going to uh, ask for your uh, thoughts on this. We're starting out with a patient who relapses while receiving adjuvant AI at the two-year point uh, and uh, uh, gets uh, uh, an AI with fulvestrin and then progresses 18 months later. And the question is, you know, based on biomarkers, how would you think through the next line of therapy in a patient who got a CDK inhibitor and fulvestrin up front and here we go with the three variables. This is the way we decided to plot it. Uh, green is it's positive and black negative. Uh, I'm told, I guess, uh, uh, Francois, uh, Dr. Bedard, you were telling me that theoretically you shouldn't have PIK3 and AKT in the same patient, or that's rare? Yeah, that, that's kind of super rare. So it's a kind of a pathway. You just need one of these EM mutational events to activate the pathway. So you don't need a redundancy So most, in most patients. So in, if you look at the overall the patient population, so most of the time it's mutually exclusive, so it's either, when the pathway is activated, it will be either PIK3CA or AKT or a P10 loss. Uh, of course, there are some exceptions to that, but uh, overall, it's um, when you find one, you will not find the other. And I should say that we, we didn't completely line everything up with part A and part B here. We're going to kind of go back and forth. Uh, but Erica, by far, in this first scenario, ESR1 positive, the other two negative, uh, people go with an oral surge. Uh, we allowed people to write in, you know, one person wrote in Elicestrin or, or Cami. I'd be curious about your thoughts about that. Um, and also what your experience is with Elicestrin in terms of tolerability. And also, do you see effective responses? Yeah, I mean, I, I do. You know, the challenge we've seen with the oral surge is post-CDK4-6, we have this population of some patients that are just endocrine resistant, right? And they're not gonna do well on subsequent endocrine therapies, but it's hard to predict who those patients are. It's not that they aren't ER positive anymore. And so having an ESR1 mutation is one way that we can enrich for patients that are more likely to be endocrine sensitive. It's not a perfect analysis by any stretch. So, you know, many patients that have an ESR1 obviously will go on to be endocrine resistant. It doesn't mean that they're endocrine sensitive, but it's a way to enrich for a population that's more likely to respond to CERD. I think um, the Cami Zestrant uh, vote here is that that's our other trial that has had positive randomized data um, at two doses. So, um, you know, those are our, our two uh, encouraging uh, data from late phase uh, oral CERDs. Anything at this point to differentiate them indirectly? 
Well, I mean, there's, there's a lot of preclinical activity that not all the SERDs are equal. And, and that should make sense to us because we see different side effect profiles. Some have bradycardia. Some seem to have a little bit more GI toxicity. Um, Elicestrin is a little bit more of a SERM uh, than a SERD uh, compared to some of the other SERDs. And so I think as we get smarter with these, we'll realize that there are certain patient populations where one may be a little bit better for a patient than other. And can you educate us between the difference between a SERD and a SERM and what is something SERM-like, what that means? Yeah, so a SERM is a selective estrogen receptor modulator, so it can be more agonistic in some tissues and antagonistic in, the, in others. So, you know, examples there are more, uh, you know, tamoxifen, lasofoxifen, et cetera, and a SERD is a true degrader. All right, well, now let's get to the more challenging ones. Hope you can take this one. So, so same scenario except now ESR1 and PIK3 positive, but AKT negative. So interestingly, you see, okay, ESR1, I'm thinking SERD, PIK3, at this point I'm thinking uh, uh, alpalisib. So certainly we see some SERD, but I don't see too much alpalisib, I see more CAPI. Any thoughts? <laughs> well, first, it's when the survey came out. <laughs> so the survey came out. Some of us did the survey right away, but some of us will go unnamed. <laughs> uh, did the survey a little later, still on time. And we sent it out ten days ago, <laughs> just so you know. Yeah. So some of us did it this last weekend. So the CAPI was approved, sort of in between there. Right. So that may have impacted people's answers, just to say. And I think that when somebody has co-mutations of ESR1 and PIK3CA, it's actually a fascinating situation. It represents certainly a minority of the patients who have either mutation. But I think then we're really trying to use the data data we have to use the best sequencing of therapy without any data to tell us what's right. So in general, without survival data to tell us otherwise, we would use the least toxic, easiest therapy first, and then we would go to the more mutation-focused therapy next. So I think most of us chose elicestrin for that reason. And then we would go on to capivacertib and fulvestrin, which is how it's approved. So you can't give CAPI and an other drug right now. And we don't have data with CAPI and an AI in a randomized phase three trial. Most people wouldn't choose the alpelisib first, mainly because of the challenges we deal with in terms of toxicity of alpelisib, despite its potency uh, and efficacy, dealing with hyperglycemia and bad rash is something that none of us want to do in oncology, it takes up a lot of time. I don't think it's wrong to say Everolimus, uh, but I think that because the patient has a PIK3C mutation and ESR1, uh, you wouldn't want to give exemestane because exemestane has been demonstrated not to have the efficacy of even fulvestrant in that patient population. And then we don't have camazestrin to give, so of course I didn't vote for a drug which wasn't available. So I think it's a really fascinating situation. And when you have an AKT P10, um, and you probably would vote similarly. So, uh, pretty much over my head, I hope it's not over your head, and you're picking all this stuff up, but let's go to another one that I think maybe, you know, we can go back also and take a look at these. Uh, we also have another entire cassette in the appendix of a patient, instead of relapsing on an astrozole, presents with metastatic disease, just as different. But you gotta really look at these and think about them and talk about them. I'm just kind of giving you a little tasting menu. Kamal, uh, this is, this is kind of where we were a couple years ago, I guess. We didn't have any of these biomarkers or too many of these uh, therapies, uh, but how do you approach patients that don't have any of these? Yeah, no, so I think this one is more like what we were able to do a few years ago and still hasn't changed. So for our wild-type tumors where we don't find a biomarker, may it be ESR1, may it be PIK3CA, or now EKT and P10, I think Everolimus is what we did because as Hope pointed out just not too long ago, that I think we're shying away from single-agent endocrine therapy after patients have progressed on a CDK4-6 inhibitor given the limited progression-free survival benefit there. So here you could choose Everolimus with endocrine therapy, and I think both exemestane and full could be appropriate choices in many ways, even though this is an ESR1 negative tumor, given the first line therapy was full Westrant with a CDK4-6 inhibitor. And if you look at, you know, uh, data sets of, you know, whether we have data for AI-based therapy after full Westrant-based therapy, I think we have some from the Bileave uh, study, the phase two study with Alpelazib and various endocrine partners. We don't necessarily know for a patient who's progressed on full Westrant what eczema stain would necessarily look like, but because it's ESR1 negative, I would have a conversation with the patient and would be very happy to consider that as a treatment option with Everolimus here. 
So again, you can look at all kinds of, uh, you know, variations of these themes, so to speak, and start to talk to your colleagues about what you might do or what you are going to do in these uh, various uh, situations. But uh, let's move on now and uh, get some other comments uh, from our faculty uh, in terms of how they think uh, through uh, second-line therapy. Uh, and um, I'll ask Dr. Bedard to comment on uh, what Dr. Sharma says. For patients that have a PIK3CA mutation, I would favor using alpalisib with endocrine therapy as a second-line therapy, even if they have an ESR1 mutation. And I'd go to alicestrant as my third-line therapy because the emerald trial included third-line patients. For patients who just have an ESR1 and no PIK3CA, then after the first line, alicestrant seems a very reasonable choice. For patients that have neither of those, the second-line treatment choice depends on how long they got with the first-line treatment, how long for disease control, and what endocrine therapy partner were they on. They're on an AI plus CDK4-6, and second-line full restaurant is a reasonable choice, but we are more and more seeing from our trials that the median PFS in that kind of setting is two to four months with full restaurant, so it really gives very minimal amount of disease control. Full Western plus Everolimus is a choice. You know, one could consider that in the mutation, both PIK3CA and ESR1 mutation negative patients. Of course, we've now seen phase three data from AKT inhibitor, Capip assertive. Additional CIRCs and CIRCAs and PROTAC inhibitors are all being studied in this space. I was just thinking, Francois, you know, the new fellows who come in every year, you know, like, oh, this is how we do second-line therapy. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any thoughts? What's your secret sauce, uh, Francois? Uh, well, so we, in France, we just got access, uh, or let's say over the past month, we got access to um, Elacestran. And uh, so we, we think that it's a really easy drug. So uh, we would prioritize Elacestran in the presence of an ESR1 mutation even though there is something else on the uh, P3CA AKT pathway, because uh, so we know if Olimus is toxic and um, alpelisib is very toxic, capivastatib is apparently less toxic, but still um, comes with um, significantly higher toxicity, I think, compared to Elacestran, which is quite easy. But then, to use Elacestran, I would, uh, we are restricting the use of Elacestran to the patient who had a long time on prior CDK4-6 inhibitor in the first line, and this was the case that you mentioned. You mentioned something that is a bit unusual, if I may, that a patient that will relapse quite early on the adjuvant treatment, so after two years on adjuvant AI, so I would call it still an early relapse, and then that patient had a very long, like um, 18 months PFS in first line with Trilvestran plus CDK. So, which means uh, I think it's a good candidate for Elacestran if he has one mutant, and if not, uh, well, current practice in France would be Fulvestran plus Everolimus because of this long PFS under Fulvestran in first line and a short you know, time to relapse with AI in the adjuvant setting. And we are looking forward to use uh, you know, Capivacetib when it will be made available. So hope uh, tune in Friday night to our myeloma session and you want to hear about quadruplets <laughs> that are now standard of care first-line therapy. Any thoughts about the... Well, so, about the case and the long duration, we had uh, one of our first patients we put on Paloma 2 uh, relapsed with multiple bone meds at three years on tamoxifen. She's now on 11 years letrozole. She had her ovaries out because that's how she was eligible and uh, palbociclib. So you know, the targeted agents make a huge difference. This patient is so unique because of the fulvestrant, and when you have the mutation, so we face this, right? Patient has mutations, you want to give a CDK4-6 inhibitor, you haven't. So you give the CDK4-6 inhibitor, then what are you going to give? Patient recurred on an astrozole, and now they've progressed on fulvestrant. So the trials that are being done now, which is combining just about every new endocrine therapy we have with all of the targeted agents, those are really going to drive what the next steps are. And maybe we'll have data next year where we can talk about that, where this patient would go on camisestrant or elisestrant with capivacertib or another uh, targeted agent. Don't forget the bispecifics. You've got to get one of those along <laughs> the line. Kamal? Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, one of the analyses that will be presented on Friday is from the phase three emerald trial. And they're going to present subgrouping for progression-free survival in various subgroups, including concurrent mutations in the PIK3CA mutation. So we might have some sense, at least from that phase three study, 
how did an oral sir do in a patient who had both ESR1 and C concurrent pic 3 ca mutation? So that's happening on Friday. At least we'll get some flavor of what LSS trend did. But it's a data-free zone in many ways, right? What we don't know is Capitello did not allow prior fulvestrant. And here we're saying this patient has already had fulvestrant with a CDK4-6 inhibitor. We're offering them LSS trend after that for all the good reasons we summarized. And then we're relying on Capiva and fulvestrant. So yes, the targeted therapy is going to be very, very important. But what we don't know necessarily is what sequence is really the ideal way. And it might differ as we have a better understanding of who those patients would be and why. We don't have that yet. But the combination <laughs> of a novel endocrine partner and API3K AKT agent, and those are ongoing studies right now, might be the ideal solution for this 12% of concurrent mutations at least. It just happens that Kamal's presentation on Friday might be the right treatment for a patient like this up front. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> Virginia, I'd like to hear what you have to say about Dr. Brofsky's thoughts on second-line hormonal therapy. LSS is very well tolerated. I've used it quite a bit, actually. I think a lot of us will probably use capivacertib instead of alpelacid. And the reason for that is probably a toxicity reason. I think that there's far less hyperglycemia, it appears, with capivacertib. It's only given four days a week, not seven. I think that the tagline is going to be, and I keep telling this to people, take the weekend off. That's what we're going to tell people. Take the weekend off of your capivacertib. If their PA3 kind is wild type, then I think I'll use Verilimus as a second-line agent. I think the issue with capivacertib, I think, is going to be diarrhea. It's not going to be the hyperglycemia, thankfully. I think that that really scared a lot of people away from using alpelacib. But what I usually do with alpelacib and hyperglycemia, I'll do a fasting blood glucose every week, and if it's over 150, start to push the metformin. When I have maxed the metformin, then I go down on the alpelacib. And once I've hit a certain level of alpelacid and I have to think about insulin, I will stop the drug completely. I think that the lack of hyperglycemia and I think the ease of use of capivacertib may actually lead people to give more capivacertib than alpelacid. We just don't know yet. We'll have to see how it goes. Any thoughts, Virginia, and any thoughts about the challenges of getting the patient to follow the regimen and take it when they need it? So, so I think the, I, the challenge is going to be there because four days on and three days off is something that we're not used to and our patients are not used to as well. I think something that's important that, and for us and for drug development is that it seems that over and over again we have a drug approved and then we try to figure out how to tweak it so we can give it safely to our patients. And we did this with Everolimus and stomatitis and the mouthwash. We're doing this, we did this with Alpelacib and, and hyperglycemia. We're likely going to do this with CAPI. One of the other issues with CAPI that I think is going to be important ones we start using it is rash. We have a, a relatively, not extremely high, but a, a, an interesting amount of grade three and four rash that we need to understand how we can bypass. Should we be giving an, an antihistamine ahead of time prior to the start of treatment, which I think is what, what we're going to end up with, so that we can again safely give, give these drugs safely to our patients. Yeah, that intermittent schedule is really interesting. I always wonder whether if you did that with Alpelisib, you know, how that would affect... Uh, Tolerability, Opolis. Okay, one more comment. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, Erica, I'd like you to respond to uh, Priyanka's uh, thoughts about how she uses Opolisib. I think there were a lot of safety measures in the trial that we get to follow in clinic, and that I think what lands us and our patients into trouble. Number one is you have to check the even see if it's above a certain threshold. You just shouldn't prescribe the drug. In most of the trials that use Alpelisib, there was a blood sugar check within two to seven days, right? So you don't wait an entire month to check it. So you're catching that early hyperglycemia and managing it before the patient ends up in the hospital with DKA. So I follow that. The other thing I follow is I make sure that my patients have actually had a phone consultation with a diabetic dietary person. So they have talked to them about carbohydrate intake. It really makes an impact on hyperglycemia. Rash can be easily controlled with prophylactic Claritin or Zyrtex. So you just prescribe it every day and that cuts down the rash dramatically. Their subsequent studies have shown that. Diarrhea is something that you just have to be proactive for. So it's not an easy drug. Erica. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I, I definitely think that um, the antihistamines have helped in terms of rash. Uh, you know, hyperglycemia is still a big problem. You know, there are patients that just aren't a candidate based on their A1C. And, you know, in Tennessee, we also have a lot of people that are obese and, you know, get into more problems with alpelisib. So it's not an ideal drug. Um, 
you know, for some people. I think, I think the trouble is that a lot of times there's a drug where we know that there's really gonna be one side effect that's the problem, right? Abimacyclib, aggressively counsel on diarrhea, otherwise the patient's probably gonna be okay, right? Um, this is a drug where you can't necessarily predict what problem the patient's gonna have. Is it gonna be you know, rash? Is it gonna be hyperglycemia? Is it gonna be diarrhea? So it's just a little bit trickier to kind of educate people ahead of time, so I think close follow-up is important. That was a really interesting comment. I never thought about that. Okay, Kamal, let's talk about uh, strategy to overcome resistance. Thank you so much. So talking about endocrine therapy, we know that those are very effective, but what we've also learned is that resistance is inevitable in these patients, unfortunately, and the tumors start progressing. And some of the mechanisms of endocrine resistance that we have learned over the past two decades is alteration of the cell survival and cell cycle pathways, activation of growth factor signaling pathways, deregulation of the ER pathway with emergence of ESR1 mutations that we were talking about. And with growth factor signaling pathways, the PI3K AKT mTOR pathway is frequently altered in approximately 40% of our HR-positive breast cancer patients. And certainly that has implications because we know that PI3K signaling then promotes estrogen-independent growth of the ER-positive breast cancer. And this can be inhibited by addition of agents that target this PI3K AKT mTOR pathway. And really the proof of concept that we go, uh, got for targeting this pathway came from the Bolero 2 and the Precog studies that first led to the approval of exemestane plus everolimus compared to placebo with everolimus with near doubling of the progression-free survival from 3.2 months to 7.8 months. And on your right are the Kaplan-Meier curves for everolimus, and in this case it was with fulvestrant, and this is what we were referring to, doubling of PFS from 5.1 to 10.3 months. Very important to remember these are CDK4-6 naive patients and we did not see an overall survival benefit in these trials with these agents. When we think about toxicity from Everolimus, the most common toxicities are really highlighted here, including stomatitis, we have fatigue, we have dyspnea, anemia, we have hyperglycemia, and pneumonitis that can also be seen. But hyperglycemia rates are lower than what we see with alpelazib or what we were discussing with alpelazib. And the discontinuation rates that have been reported out with Everolimus are about 19% in the Bolero 2 trial compared to 4% in the placebo arm. But this was really practice changing for us because stomatitis, which was really, really a common side effect that we saw with Everolimus, uh, uh, led the study with the phase two SWISH trial, which has really changed our standard of care when we start a patient with Everolimus-based therapy. And what we've seen is prophylactic use of dexamethasone mouthwash substantially reduced the incidence and severity of stomatitis in patients receiving this combination with Everolimus. Moving up, we then decided, should we target the pathway upstream, like really up in the pathway, and would that really impact the efficacy? And this was a practice-changing data from the SOLAR1 study that evaluated fulvestrant with or without alpelacib, and surely the combination led to a statistically significant and uh, clinically mean, a meaningful improvement in progression-free survival, an improvement of a delta of 5.6 months favoring the combination. So 11 months in the... Uh, treatment arm, and then uh, uh, 5.7 months in the control arm, hazard ratio here is 0.65. We saw a numerical improvement in overall survival. The discontinuation rate in the SOLAR1 study is 25% with alpelazib fulvestrant, and the most common side effects were hyperglycemia, rash, and diarrhea. Again, important to highlight, all but 6% of these patients were CDK4-6 naive. Talking about the side effects, when we look at the details of the hyperglycemia from the SOLAR1 study, about 33% had grade 3 hyperglycemia, about 7% grade 3 diarrhea. We see rash, about 10% grade 3 rash in the SOLAR1. And so this was a study, it's a phase two study, the BILEAVE study, which really wanted to ask the question, what is the activity of alpelacib when we have patients who've already had a CDK4-6 inhibitor, and they had three different cohorts that we studied. Cohort A looked at fulvestrant with alpelacib after patients progressed on an AI and CDK4-6 as immediate therapy. Cohort B looked at letrozole with alpelacib when patients had uh, fulvestrant plus CDK4-6 as immediate prior. And then cohort three had more pretreated patient population. And you can see the range of median progression fee survival is five to seven months with this agent in the post-CDK4-6 in this phase two open label study. 
What we also learned along the way is how do we manage the side effects with these uh, drugs. And as you can see, when we look at Solar One and then we start looking at the different cohorts in Bileave, when we started recognizing the side effect profile and had interventions to manage them, that the median relative dose intensity was improved and the A's leading to discontinuation rates for hyperglycemia were lower. This was an interesting Spanish study which tried to evaluate if we use prophylactically metformin, what would happen to the hyperglycemia with alpelacib. So they would start the patients and escalate the metformin do dose over two weeks in those co patients in a cohort which had a fasting glucose of less than 100 and also in a cohort with a slightly higher fasting glucose levels. And grade three hyperglycemia with this metformin prophylactically used reduced the rates to 6% versus 36% that we had seen in Solar One. And this is about rash. The, the time to onset for grade three or higher rash is about 13 days with alpelacib, and discontinuation rate due to any grade rash was about 3% in this patients. But really, really important that we were talking about something that we have now done in our standard care practice is initiate prophylactic antihistamines because that significantly reduced the incidence and severity of grade three rash, something that we haven't done yet with AKT inhibitors that just got approved two weeks ago. So what more are we trying to do in the field? I think we're trying to really harness the power of PIK3CA inhibition, but really focus on improving the tolerability, which is why there is some excitement about the newer generation of mutant-selective PI3K inhibitors that have in, entered clinic and currently in phase one investigation, three of which are listed here, the LOXO783 compound, Relay2608, and we have the Scorpion Therapeutics478 compound. The idea is if you do not impact the inhibition of PIK3 wild type, which is what really drives the hyperglycemia, will you really have a better tolerability profile? Would that translate into better dose intensity and efficacy for these patients? So something to look out for. This is just a readout from the Relay uh, compound, which was presented at AACR, kind of preclinically telling us that this is mutant selective, really does not impact wild type. They've done some comparisons with alpelacib and anavolacib. And while it's uh, early, <coughs> early days with one uh, PR that was reported out in that small group of patients, what was really encouraging to see was the safety profile, which is what was really uh, important here, no grade three hyperglycemia, no grade three diarrhea, no grade three rash. So early days, and we look forward to more data from such uh, efforts. And moving on to the last, but the most important uh, node here as well, which is the central node, the AKT node. And here the pathway can be activated due to various reasons, including activation mutations in PI3K. We have activating mutations in AKT1 and even loss of function alterations. And we know this AKT activation can mediate resistance to chemotherapy and anti-hormone agents and can also be acquired post-CDK4-6 inhibitor therapy. So Capiva Assertive, which is a uh, pan-AKT inhibitor of isoforms one to three, uh, was studied in the Factian phase two study where we saw a doubling of PFS from five months to 10.3 months. I think it's important to point out here that initially when it was reported out, the benefit appeared independent of the activated pathway, but the pathway was only tested for PIK3CA mutations by digital droplet PCR and for P10 loss by IHC. We had not uh, tested for AKT and P10 in NGS. But when they expanded that and looked at these alterations with an NGS panel, they identified more alterations, so 54% instead of 42% with the previous efforts. And then when they redid the analysis with a longer follow-up here, the benefit was actually mainly seen in the altered subgroup, both for PFS and both for OS. The numbers are listed here on this slide. So this brings us to the phase three registrational capital 291 study. These are patients who recur on or uh, progress while on or less than 12 months from their adjuvant endocrine therapy or progression while on their prior AI for metastatic setting. No more than two lines of endocrine therapy, no more than one line of chemotherapy. Prior CDK4-6 was allowed and in fact required for 51% of these patients. No prior CERT, PI3K or AKT inhibitor. Randomized to Capiva with full Western versus full Western placebo. For dual primary endpoints of overall patient population, progression-free survival benefit, and in the altered patient population. So about 70% had prior CDK, 18% had prior chemo. The study met its dual primary endpoint. The hazard ratio was 0.6 in the intent-to-treat population, 0.50 in the AKT altered pathway population. The median PFS for Capiva assertive arm was about 7.3 months. OS data are immature from this. And the approval that we have for this drug is currently in the altered patient population. These are just the summary of the PFS subgroup analyses, and you see the benefit regardless of prior CDK, chemo, or liver metastases at baseline.
And one of the reasons that we did not see an approval for all comers is that when we looked at an exploratory analysis for patients who did not have the alterations, so 44% had the alterations, the rest did not, 16% were unknown, and when we looked at these analyses for patients did, that did not have the alteration and also excluded the 16% of the unknown, the hazard ratio here is 0.79. In, uh, with respect to side effects, it's diarrhea and rash that we think about. It's predominantly 10% grade 3 diarrhea and about 12% grade 3 rash. Low rates of grade 3 hyperglycemia, low rates of grade 3 stomatitis with this agent. And this is my last slide that kind of just gives us a flavor, not meant for cross-trial comparisons, but kind of remember the distinct side effects with these agents where we're thinking about more hyperglycemia with alpelacib, we're thinking more diarrhea and rash with um, capiva sertip, and we were thinking more about stomatitis with everolimus. Thanks, Kamal. <clears throat> I want to maybe take a minute and go through some of the many questions we're getting from the audience. I like this. Uh, somebody talked about ear positive, E-A-R, ear positive. I guess it was a spell check. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so this is what I was tr uh, trying to get into you bef before, Erica, is the, you know, sort of the, the type of responses you see with oral surds. Because uh, one of the uh, uh, questions is, uh, keep them, you know, the, reminding us that we have chemo and ADC as an option also. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, you know, trying to get at this issue of what your experience is with oral surgery and quality of response. If you have somebody who you really want to see a response in, either they have a lot of disease or they're symptomatic, do any of these second-line endocrine therapies give you the kind of responses you would see with ADCs or chemo? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I mean, I think there certainly are patients that we think about going to ADCs or chemo and not trying additional endocrine therapies, right? Patients that didn't do well on their last endocrine, um, you know, that's somebody that I really think about. I mean, I definitely have seen responses with oral surds um, as well as Protax, et cetera. Um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of these drugs. You know, there's certainly some patients that they don't work for, but there are some patients that they work really well for beyond the story that, you know, even the clinical trial data shows. You know, I was surprised when we look at the Emerald data, you know, there shouldn't even be a category of us looking at people, what their benefit was if they'd been on CDK less than six months. You know, they stratified less than six months, 12 and 18. If somebody was on a CDK4-6 inhibitor for less than six months, I don't think they should have received further endocrine therapy. I wouldn't have put them on l So sometimes in this setting, I think that the clinical trial data actually maybe undersells the benefit because we put the patients on trial that we're more worried about. And in the real world, they may actually be doing better. I've got multiple people in phase one that were on oral surge for over two years. So Hope, uh, a number of questions are really na in terms of navigating liquid and tissue biopsy and trying to get these three biomarkers. You can, you know, like which one comes first, you do them both together, how reliable, what's the false negative rate, you know, tell them you know, what to it's, do. It's really fascinating <laughs> because until quite recently, we thought that tissue was the gold standard and we should get tissue. And that's really changed. And in fact, a rapid update that Hal Burstein put together with a committee for ASCO uh, sort of reversed that whole thinking. And that's based on data that showed that liquid biopsies, they're not all the same, so a good standard liquid biopsy actually was more sensitive to find uh, the mutations we want to find, uh, activating mutations compared to tissue. And I think the issue is that when we're biopsying the liver, we get some necrosis and some liver and a little bit of tumor. And, you know, it may be very hard to get enough tissue to really accurately look at this. So liquid biopsy is now the standard of care. I think that, you know, we do look at tissue when it's available. And combined, they probably give us the best amount of information, but we don't want to do that. We're still looking looking at tissue for ERPR and HER2, uh, but there will be an interesting presentation at uh, one of the poster spotlights, Paolo pa Tarantino, uh, looking at a uh, test that might be able to look in blood in a liquid biopsy to see uh, how you characterize HER2 as being positive, low, or zero. Um, and there's other uh, companies that are looking at tests like this on circulating tumor cells. So we may actually be able to get further and further away from serial biopsies in the future. So it's time to move on to our next module, but I have to ask Virginia, because it got in my head, cell-free DNA. Uh, we're going to talk about it tomorrow night. Actually, one of the talks tomorrow night is on cell-free DNA. 
I kind of, of course, we've been talking about that a lot in other tumors, obviously colorectal cancer, part of standard of care, but I'm kind of hearing more in the breast cancer arena about cell-free. What about you, uh, the San Antonio meeting, we're gonna see some good stuff on cell-free DNA. Well, so I think we need to be a little cautious, and, and we've been burnt in the past when we've jumped the gun and just tried to make changes to our treatments based on no, on, on, on no data. And when it comes to colon cancer, they have data that if you look at adjuvant therapy, you can de de determine who needs it based on, uh, on cDNA. But in breast cancer, we don't have that data. We have data suggesting that it's prognostic, and that's great. But what do you do with the results? Can you change the outcome of your patient by, by making changes in therapy based on, on this assay? And so it's a little early, and, and I think I, I, this is an encouragement for all of us to actually do these large studies, because they need to be pretty large to, to come to, to some conclusion. So again, coming back tomorrow night, and what we saw in the survey, incidentally, was just as you said, people are not using it but sometimes in metastatic disease. And we'll talk about that tomorrow night, and there's gonna be a lecture tomorrow night. But let's move on now and talk about ADCs. You've joined the club. You're, you're now in the ophthalmic club too, I think, for the first time, right? We've been yeah. doing ophthalmic toxicity of ADC <laughs> and bladder cancer, yes, lung cancer, <laughs> GYN. You guys joined the club. I guess we're, you've been doing phase one in GYN anyhow, Erica. So do you have an ophthalmologist uh, there, incidentally? We do. I think you <laughs> we do, too. Attached. All right. Okay, let's go back to the survey. Uh, so now we're going beyond uh, endocrine therapy. So we're saying the patient has, we went through all this, you know, triple assay decision-making. They get treated. Uh, and then at some point they progress. Usual therapy at that point, I think people agree, is Cape Cytobine. The question is what comes next? Uh, so we say, you know, all these questions we said, re reimbursement issues and regulatory issues aside, so people could really focus on really the risk benefit. We said right now, what would come first, SASE or, uh, or DATO? They're saying SASE, of course, a lot more uh, data there as well. Uh, we said, what about a HER2 low? Uh, again, uh, hormone receptor positive. Of course, this has been out there ever since the HER2 data came out. I think when people initially process it, this is the initial thought they had. And if anything, it's just strengthened that for these people, HR positive TDXD comes before sasituzumab. We also asked people, we've been doing this more and more to kind of just give a general estimate of what the likelihood is that you're going to have to do a dose adjustment or even hold the dose of various drugs, and then for what the reasons are. You're gonna see a lot of that in the next uh, few days uh, in the survey. Uh, you can see uh, the estimates uh, in terms of that. Uh, so let's move on to uh, some of the comments about that, and particularly, of course, the issue about HER2 low and HER2 zero, something we're gonna spend the entire uh, Thursday night meeting on, but uh, you were talking about Dr. Tarantino, who I think he's next door too. <laughs> we have actually 11 people up here on this podium for the, this is the world record, I guess, for faculty. Here's Dr. Tarantino's uh, thoughts about uh, and, uh, what comes after Cape Cytobine. If we're talking about the most common scenario or more receptor positive HER2 low metastatic breast cancer, in this case, I think that the choice is pretty clear. TDXD has shown doubling of PFS, overall survival advantage in patients that received one medium prior line of chemo. So I think TDXD is really our preferred second line strategy. Sasituzumab was tested in the Tropic SO2 trial in later lines in patients with a median of three prior lines of chemo, 95% of the patient had visual metastasis, so a much higher risk population, late line population. And if I have to choose, I prefer having a bridge in between the two. The issue is much different in triple negative disease, where we know that both ADCs potentially can be used in second line after first line chemo with or without immunotherapy. If you don't have PARP inhibitor, what you think of in second line is for triple negative metastatic breast cancer is either sasituzumab that was well established before TDXT data, or TDXD, because you still have a major PFS advantage and also overall survival advantage in the few patients treated in DBO4. So what is my choice? I think that Sasituzumab has got more data in support because it's got a dedicated phase three trial. But at the same time, we know that they have different toxicity profiles. I was just thinking, we actually did a meeting just after the HER2 low data was presented, and this is the initial reaction. Literally, it was an hour after it was presented. We did a meeting that was the initial uh, thought. Uh, 
So, Francois, any thoughts about her too low? How do you think uh, through what comes first? Uh, so, I fully agree with Dr. Tarantino. So, I think in terms of data, we have an, uh, also um, clearance by the regulatory agency. So, um, EA plus, so we'll do TDXD for the air too low, of course, uh, category, TDXD first, and then the question is about what to do when the patient will progress. Do you go directly to CSC or do you do something else in between? Uh, knowing that they have kind of same of payload, topo one inhibitors. So um, let's say the first antibody would be uh, trastumab de Uxtecan. And then, uh, you know, for the triple negative uh, breast cancer, then we are favoring SASI uh, because of the amount of data and, uh, you know, the, the triple negative subgroup uh, in the TDXD trial was very small, it was 60 patients that were randomized two to one, so which means the control arm is 20 patients. So yes, there is a huge benefit, but still, you know, it's a benefit between 40 and 20 patients. So um, overall, I fully agree with what has been said. So uh, I'm curious, uh, Hope, uh, what your thoughts are. Am I remembering this correctly? Did you go to high school? With Eric? I did. That's what I thought. <laughs> you know that? I did. We went to high school together. High school with Eric. It just, it just it's popped into been my a long time. Eric. <laughs> Anyhow, I caught him right after he'd done this consensus thing in, uh, in Europe. Uh, so I asked him about her too low. At this moment in time, if a patient has her too low disease, I would then reach for trastuzumab durexican. And I would give that prior to giving sasitusumab or anything else. And that was actually the preference at the recent ABC meeting when we ran a consensus conference. And this was in Lisbon a week ago. And the question was asked in an ER positive patient who has HER2 low expression, what's your next drug after capecitabine? And the answer in well over 90% of respondents was TDXD, which was a different answer than the answer in a triple negative patient who had her too low expression, but where given the numbers of patients in the various trials and the efficacy of sasituzumab there, the choice was sasituzumab first. Any comments about interstitial lung disease in TDXD? The interesting thing is, I think that in day-to-day -day clinical practice, ILD seems to be, for whatever reasons, less of a problem than was suggested in the initial studies. And I think that may be because we're not using it after quite as many different lines of therapy as was the case in the initial trials. So Hope, you know, I feel like every day we're talking about her too, you know, lung, lung cancer, upper GI, lower GI, gynecologic. And then when you start talking to the other people who haven't had the experience you do, there's some interesting things about testing, ILD, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm trying to tell them what you're telling me. <laughs> but first of all, can you comment on what he was saying in terms of sequencing? He actually, he actually said he hadn't seen, you know, clinically significant ILD himself. Um, any thoughts? Yeah, I think that uh, one, I think the whole community agrees that based on the data we have for HR positive HER2 low disease, we're going to give TDXD first. There's no question. And for sasituzumab, it's a great option for HER2 zero and for patients potentially sequentially. <coughs> There's actually a whole spotlight session here at San Antonio looking at sequential ADCs, and there will be prospective trials as well. ILD I don't agree with him so much about because if you're looking for grade one ILD and you give a lot of TDXD, mm -hmm. which we've done, you see grade one ILD. And you know we traditionally will hold the drug, give 0.5 milligrams per kilogram of prednisone because I'm impatient, and then do a scan at three weeks. And in almost all patients, it's cleared. The only patients where it hasn't cleared, have one patient, an elderly woman with million lines of prior therapy who actually has brain damage. So I mean, it was a really, this is a very tough situation where we don't know what's going on. Uh, I have had a patient progress to grade two ILD. One patient who was on DBO4, who had grade one, was on steroids, held, went back on it, and eventually progressed to grade two and had to come off completely. And so, in my mind, this really close monitoring and careful treatment will completely prevent mortality from ILD. So in that, I agree with Eric. But I think if you're looking for it, it's there. 
Uh, Virginia, any comments? And also, uh, patients who don't recover in 28 days, does that change whether you re-challenge? Yeah, so, so my, my most recent patient was somebody with a grade 3 ILD who I had to admit to the hospital, uh, left the hospital, was on oxygen. She's doing better. But, but a couple of issues that arise that are real, real world issues. First of all, they had to rule out any infectious etiology. So she had a bronchoscopy. They, they did a PCR for PCP, which was positive. ID thinks it's falsely positive, but had to treat her. Now she came in last week to, 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 to just be checked. And we looked at her LFTs, and her LFTs are increasing. And so now I'm not sure, are they increasing because of the PCP therapy? Are they increasing because her cancer is actually progressing off of treatment? I can't treat her with anything else because she's still on oxygen. And so, of course, I'm getting scans, which are going to be done this week, where I'm not going to be there. Uh, but this is what we, we, we have to think about, because grade one is wonderful, and we need to prevent, and that's great. But what happens when everything else is delayed because we're still waiting for recovery from that ILD, and then the disease progresses. So that's 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 a, that's an issue. But I do rechallenge them if they if they uh, recover within 28 days and they have grade one ILD. Kamel, any comments? And also, people always bring up the patient who's had a great response, and you know they they do get symptomatic, but they do fully recover. Are there any situations where you would rechallenge grade two or greater? So grade two, I would not. And I think that's what the guidance we have uh, for TDX to use from the package insert and what we learned from the trials as well. And I think this really, really underscores the importance of really being cognizant about this uh, ILD as a side effect and right, really educating our patients. So, you know, when we're doing scans in standard of care practice, we usually do scans every three or four months for metastatic patients. But here, we might be doing scans a little sooner because we want to identify this grade one ILD because we could re-challenge those patients, we can promptly start the steroids that Hope was mentioning at 0.5 milligram per kilogram, and actually continue therapy if it resolves really quickly. But for grade two, which is symptomatic and radiologic changes, we're discontinuing regardless of when it recovers. We require a higher dose of steroids, we require a longer taper of steroids. And so I think it's very, very important for us to recognize that. And one last comment I'll make is that I think IHC0 is where we think about uh, sasituzumab, uh, certainly, and Tropic so to give us data for very pre-treated patients where we use it, or for patients that are not TDXT candidates. So if somebody, say, had Everolimus or Alpelisib just recently as their preceding therapy, just not too long ago, or landed up having baseline pneumonitis findings, that would be a patient I would not want to offer TDXT, or would be a little nervous to offer. For TDXD right away. So I think those are the kind of things, and that's why NCCN allows you or gives you the guidance to use sasituzumab even early on for a patient who's not eligible for TDXD. Yeah, we're going to talk a lot on Thursday about IHC of zero, if it does exist. But anyhow, <laughs> uh, so uh, Francois, I'd like you to comment on Dr. Sharma. We were talking a lot about uh, sasituzumab, and we're going to talk in a minute about uh, DATO and patritumab for that matter. Uh, here's Dr. Sharma's thoughts. SASE is actually a pretty well-tolerated drug. Once you get kind of a handle on the cytopenia, some patients will need growth factor support. Once you get that going, it is a very well-tolerated drug because there's very less cumulative toxicity that requires you to stop the drug. So if it's working to control the cancer, I have people on it for two, three years. There's no neuropathy. There's no cumulative cardiac toxicity. I don't have to scan their lungs every six weeks or what have you to look for ILD. So I like that drug because if it works, then I don't have to stop it for toxicity rarely. If it's a patient who does not have HER2 low disease, then Dato DXD and sasituzumab are both viable options for hormone positive metastatic breast cancer. And looking at cross trial comparisons between Tropics and the Dato DXD, Tropion Breast O1 trial, the hazard ratio for improvement in PFS is similar between the two trials. We haven't seen the overall survival data from the Tropion, but we've seen it from Tropics. Ultimately, our institutions' pathways and insurance carriers might start dictating what we use in what sequence. Yeah, we've been telling the lung people about the swish and sw you know, swallow, and I don't know, is that working <laughs> in data? Yes. So, yeah. so, yeah. <laughs> so Francois, any thoughts about uh, Dr. Sharma's comment? Uh, yes, yeah, so I agree that um, overall, sesotinimab gritic are the main cause of, uh, you know, uh, to stop this drug is mostly um, disease progression. So it's rarely toxicity, but so the first few months could be, uh, let's say, 
sometimes difficult to manage, but that's overall we can make it. So that's, uh, I would not call it an easy drug, though. There is alopecia, there is a lot of astenia and so on, there is um, heme toxicity. So, um, not an easy drug, but still it is manageable. And uh, because we know the patient are deriving a clear benefit of it, uh, you know, we um, make that happen. And when it comes to data, so far, the data we have, so there is no overall survival data that is mature enough. So it's, it's kind of difficult to, to prioritize and to say that data should be prioritized in any patient versus SASE. But uh, this um, side effect profile is kind of very different. So maybe it would help us to navigate between the two drugs. And also, the linker of the two drugs are very different, So which means uh, in terms of biomarker, we know that sasituzumab is, um, could be given um, you know, independently of TROP2 expression for DATO. The linker is very different, so again, maybe that's, there will be more impact of TROP2 expression on the drug efficacy. We'll see. So, Hope, your talk has the dangerous word of current to start it, because <laughs> it could be different tomorrow. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, where we are today. Uh, in terms of ADCs and uh, uh, breast cancer. Before we get started, Dr. Tarantino uh, made a comment, I don't know if you heard him, about the idea of putting something in between, like either ADCs or ADCs who have the same payload or, you know, that whole resistance concept that came, came out of, like, chemo. Do you kind of go into that? It's all theoretical right at the moment. It's the idea that the mechanisms of resistance could be downregulation of the receptor. So if you give something else, you're going to upregulate the receptor, and then you might be more responsive. That would make more sense if the antibody was targeting the same receptor. Uh, but the other thing is that since we mainly have topo isomerase 1 inhibitors as the payload, that maybe a mutation would revert or you would be less resistant because you gave something else in between. So totally theoretical. We don't know, uh, and that's one concept that has been put forth. Until we have really studies to understand it, we don't know. Does that mean it's not in your head? <laughs> that it's not in your head? You know what I mean? That you don't really think about it at all? No, I mean, I think that... Um, Yes, I, don't, I think that's generally the case. I think that, you know, if you have another great agent you're going to use in between, you could. You could give the agents back to back. Because of the toxins being relatively similar, I think most of us like the idea of giving something in between. But I, that's not based on any fact. But we do a lot of things because we think the idea sounds better. It's good for the patient. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at some data. All right, so current role of ADCs in the management of HR-positive metastatic breast cancer. And of course, we have a short time to go through uh, this data, so it's brief. But I think the really cool thing about this revolution in ADCs, I mean, we had trastuzumab amtansine, right? Why is it all so different now? These relatively third-generation ADCs have novel linkers, so uh, they actually can deliver the payload better to the tumor cell. And the receptors, uh, the antibodies have very high affinity for the receptor. Of course, we know her too, uh, but there's something about the linker technology um, that allows the drug and also the high drug to antibody ratio that allows delivery of toxin to cells even that don't express the target at very high levels. So that's why we have a revolution in these ADCs. And one of the concepts, which this is a cartoon for, is that you have a bystander effect. And the thought is that the toxins we're using now are more hydrophilic, so they can leak out of the cancer cell, but even hydrophobic. Uh, uh, payloads of the new ADCs with these better linker technology have, can have a bystander effect. But you kill all sorts of cells that don't necessarily have the high receptor expression. So these are an exciting and effective drug delivery system. We've seen efficacy across all of the subtypes we have of breast cancer, HER2 positive, triple negative disease, HER2 low, and HR positive disease. So very exciting. And of course, there are many trials now moving these agents into the first line setting, post neoadjuvant and neoadjuvant setting. But we have a lot of questions defining HER2 low that will be discussed tomorrow night, or Thursday night, uh, sequencing ADCs and understanding mechanisms of resistance, and as you heard, managing toxicity is critical. So TDXD, of course, high drug to antibody ratio of 8 to 1 uh, with a uh, topoisomerase inhibitor to antibody 
study, which is a biosimilar of trastuzumab. Um, and this is another graphic of the bystander effect. And of course, you have all these slides. You're familiar with Destiny Bresto 4, a really remarkable phase three trial that randomized patients who had one to two lines of prior chemotherapy and had centrally confirmed HER2 low disease to receive TDXD and a treatment of physician choice. Uh, about 50% of the patients received aribulin across all of our trials. So also tropics with sasituzumab. 557 patients with a primary endpoint of PFS in the hormone receptor positive patients by blinded independent central review. Uh, but there was an intent to treat population with 58 patients who had triple negative HER2 low disease. At the primary analysis that we're all familiar with, the medium follow-up was 18 months. Um, and then this was updated with an additional investigator assessed analysis of PFS and overall survival longer follow-up uh, at, at ESMO this year. And that's what I'm presenting you. And here the patient population is listed there. This is the updated overall survival with a longer median follow-up shown at ESMO this year. Uh, you can see the primary analysis lifted in that table below. And what is true, what is remarkable here is that the overall survival difference is relatively the same. Hazard ratios are the same, longer follow-up, no real follow change at all. And when you add 58 patients with triple negative disease, you don't impact the overall survival in the total population. You're still seeing this remarkable benefit that starts early and continues out for a very long time with impressive landmark analyses. This is the updated PFS by investigator assessment shown here. One of the things that came up for all of us when we looked at these, we were like, wait, the hazard ratio in the primary analysis is so much better than what's in the New England Journal paper. But that's because this was investigator assessed rather than the blinded independent center review referred to as Bicker, which I've shown to you below in that table. Um, in the hormone receptor positive cohort and in all patients, the curves separate early, had this dramatic difference with amazing landmark uh, analyses showing differential uh, benefit of TDXT versus what was our best chemotherapy. Remember, aribulin was approved based on a trial that looked at heavily pretreated patients where aribulin beat all the other chemotherapy drugs for an overall survival primary endpoint. Uh, but here we're seeing that this was better. As Paolo mentioned earlier, the median number of prior chemotherapy regimens in this patient group was one, and about 70% of patients had CDK4-6 inhibitors. The subgroup analyses are shown here, and I made them really small because you can see that they all line up, so you don't need to really look at them. Uh, the, all of the subgroup groups uh, showed superiority of TDXD to chemotherapy for overall survival in the hormone receptor positive patients and in all patients, and for progression-free survival. In terms of adverse events, we talked about ILD and pneumonitis. What's the most common toxicity of TDXD? Nausea. And so nausea is something that we've really worked on trying to manage in the NCCN. It's a highly emetogenic agent, so you can give a triple drug, initial pre-medication. And then we use a lot of olanzapine, which is incredibly helpful and uh, efficacious in preventing this sort of delayed nausea we can see in some patients receiving TDXD, 2.5 milligrams at bedtime. There's a minimal cardiac toxicity, and then there was one additional additional death with longer follow-up from interstitial lung disease, but this patient had ILD uh, when, they, when the first analysis was made, but hadn't died yet of their toxicity. So it's a very important toxicity. There was a pooled analysis of ILD pneumonitis uh, based on nine TDXD monotherapy studies published last year by Chris Powell, who served as the chair of the adjudication committee. And I've circled there patients who are more likely to have toxicity uh, more times since disease diagnosis, but importantly being from Japan having lung comorbidities and renal insufficiency. Important to think about in your patients. And almost all ILD occurs in the first year. So we could, see, we could actually scan less frequently after the first year, but you might want to scan more frequently in a heavily pretreated patient population or patients with renal insufficiency. Um, we talked about the management here uh, in terms of holding for grade one and stopping for grade two or greater. What about the use of TDXD? It's so remarkable in HER2 low disease, and our laboratory colleagues in pathology question our ability to really tell anything about one plus versus zero, and even the difference between one plus and two plus. So this study, the DAISY trial, was a small trial, and it looked at HER2 zero um, in cohort three here, um, as well as looking at patients who were HER2 positive and HER2 low. What's interesting is you can see there were responses in all three groups, uh, but median PFS was very much aligned to 
how HER2 positive the tumor was, 11, 7, and four months for patients who had HER2 zero disease, and in ER negative disease, it was only 4.2. Uh, it was only 2.1 months, so very short. But nonetheless, this has created great interest, um, and Destiny Breast 06 will address this first-line study looking at TDXD versus chemotherapy of physician choice after and adjuvant endocrine therapy. 850 patients, and 150 of those patients will have neither one plus or zero, so-called ultra-low HER2 by IHC. So that will drive our pathologist crazy if that's positive, uh, but we'll see. That trial has completed accrual, and we'll see results next year. There also has been results in uh, San Antonio last year of the Begonia trial with TDXD and Dervalumab in the first-line setting in patients who have HER2 low metastatic triple negative disease. And I just threw this in here because you can see the remarkable PFS of 12 months and the nice spaghetti plot and waterfall plot. So what about sasetuzumab, the first in class trope 2 directed ADC with remarkable efficacy in the ascent trial in triple negative heavily pretreated disease tested in patients in tropics O2 who had hormone receptor positive HER2 negative disease and who had received a median of three lines of prior chemotherapy, 95% with visceral disease and a median of four years from diagnosis of metastatic hormone receptor positive disease in a population that has a median survival of about five and a half years with CDK4-6 inhibitors this was a heavily pretreated population where there was a significant improvement in progression-free and overall survival, as you can see here, as well as remarkable landmark analyses. In terms of evaluating biomarkers, there was no difference based on trope 2 expression or HER2 expression in terms of the benefit in PFS and OS. What is the most common toxicity of sasetuzumab? It's neutropenia, shown here, managed by growth factors, and then diarrhea, where there's a 10% rate of grade three or greater diarrhea. There was also an improved overall response rate as well. There is no ILD associated uh, with uh, sasetuzumab, and the nausea seems to be a little bit less. UGT1A1 has been explored with star 28 homozygous patients having a higher risk of toxicity from sasetuzumab. It's not recommended to do pharmacogenomics, but you have access to this it may help understand the toxicity. And in patients with STAR28 homozygous disease who have diarrhea, you could easily dose reduce and then maintain the efficacy with less toxicity. There are a number of trials going on in the first line setting, uh, looking at sasetuzumab with or without uh, pembrolizumab, uh, and of course, uh, looking at this in the early stage setting as well. Uh, just to finish, there was very interesting data from Mass General looking at three patients who were treated with sasetuzumab and developed resistant disease over time, like all of our patients do. They found mutations in TOPE1 that lead to decreased binding of SN38 with topoisomerase 1, and then mutations in TROPE2, where you couldn't bind sasetuzumab to the receptor. Fascinating three different areas of toxicity, of uh, resistance that, you know, if we knew that in advance, you could actually maybe individualize therapy. Sequencing important, little data at ASCO. Mostly the first one works better than the second one, but for some patients, the second one works better than the first one, and there are a number of sequencing studies going on, and I encourage you to go to the Spotlight presentation where we'll hear three presentations about sequencing. And there's my roadmap, and I think that we may be moving ADCs even earlier if we can define the patients who have truly endocrine-resistant disease earlier. Thanks so much. We're going to move on in a second and talk about SIRDS. Uh, but first, quick question from the audience. Kamal, uh, someone says that um, they find fatigue a major issue with TDXD. Do you ever stretch it out to a 28-day cycle rather than 21? I haven't done that, actually. I mean, if I really think that I have somebody with intolerable grade twos or significant toxicity, I would dose reduce. And, and I would have considered a dose reduction and keeping them on the same dosing schedule because we really don't know uh, necessarily if by using a Q28-day schedule if that's better for the patient. Just another one quickly, uh, Kamal. <clears throat> How does the presence of brain mets affect your choices and decision-making in the first and second-line setting? So when we think about ER-positive tumors, I mean, necessarily we don't see brain metastases as a frequent way of a presentation in ER-positive tumors. That's more of a late finding. Certainly, we've seen uh, new and very exciting emerging data with TDXD. In HER2-positive patients, we have uh, many trials, such as the DEBRA trial. We have the Tuxedo trial. We have an ongoing uh, DESTINY-12 study. Um, that is really evaluating its role in brain metastases. And so I think that is, you know, an, Previously, we used to think that these are large molecules, they don't penetrate the blood-brain barrier, and we might not see CNS activity, but unlike that, we're actually beginning to see that. 
So I would be comfortable even for our HER2 low patient potentially to be considering that as an option. We don't have definitive data yet in that patient population. But fortunately, that's not a frequent presentation in the first or second line. We had a wild case on our a GI webinar of a HER2 positive esophageal cancer with a complete response in the brain to TDXD. That's fantastic. I said, like, write it up. It happens. <laughs> you know, there is retrospective data even with TDM1. Yeah, right. So we've seen CNS activity with antibody drug conjugates. And I think once you have brain metastases and there's this breach in the blood-brain barrier, I think this thought process about these bigger molecules not making it perhaps is not necessarily the right way of thinking about them. So we're excited about this potential for these class of agents to be utilized for this patient population. All right, let's talk a little bit about SIRDs. And uh, before Dr. Bedard does starts out, uh, here's some more uh, information related to, you know, the estimated chance of holding a drug because of toxicity. You can see uh, CAPI. I was kind of surprised it wasn't higher with CAPI, but 13%. And the toxicities that we've talked about, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we also asked the faculty, uh, we're going to hear, going to hear about another CERD with some great mature data, camizestrin, what they saw potentially as the role there. You can again read through this on the iPad or in the Zoom room. Uh, but um, obviously, as ESR1 patients, uh, one of the people thought it was going to be a, ta a toss up between Camini and Elisestrin. Um, also, somebody brings up the issue, it maybe depends on what the label is going to show. Again, we have lots of comments for you to leave through about that. But I think maybe we ought to take a look at uh, some data. And before we do, here are some thoughts from Dr. Mizell. I've actually had some good luck with LSSTRIN. So for those patients who've been on AI and CDK4-6 inhibitors for a long period of time and then develop an ESR1 mutation, especially if they don't have a huge symptomatic burden of disease at their progression, I will often start LSSTRIN because I find that it's very well tolerated. And the patients whom it works well, it's a great option. I'm actually very excited about data DXD. I've had the chance to see it and use it in clinical trials here at Emory and have been pleased with what I've seen so far, both in terms of tolerability and the outcome. So I'm definitely excited to see where that goes and how that gets approved and where it fits into our armamentarium. As of now, I'm using capecitabine really after I you know, find that patients are endocrine resistant and feel I need to move on. Just because I think capecitabine works so well, it's an oral agent, patients tend to tolerate it nicely after the capecitabine if they're not a TDXD candidate just because I was impressed with the Tropic So2 data and with how patients did on that compared to single agent chemo, which I think we all acknowledge is not a perfect option. I do find that TDXD tends to be also pretty well tolerated in these patients. And I've seen a lot of patients who are you know, really quite symptomatic from their metastatic ER positive disease, have their cancer really regress nicely on that drug and do very well with it. So uh, we'll talk more about data uh, in the next module, but it was kind of interesting how the big two trials in lung and breast both popped in at ESMO at the same time. We were talking to lung people, we we're talking to you back and forth, new drug for both of you really, it's really kind of cool. Uh, but let's get back to a drug we've had around for a little bit and uh, some more coming on, uh, SIRS, uh, including full, uh, l, l Yes, thank you. So um, the idea of the talk is just to uh, review the current data we have for these uh, SIRS and especially the new SIRS. Um, what can we do for ER-positive metastatic breast cancer patients? Um, yeah, uh, so t just briefly to recap the mechanism of action of endocrine therapy. So um, you all know what happens when you have no endocrine therapy. So ER binds to, uh, estradiol binds to ER alpha, which dimerize and translocate to the nucleus and activate uh, a transcription of several genes that eventually will uh, make the tumor grow. Um, I'm not going to recap, so mechanism of action of AI, um, and same for tamoxifen. But here about SEDS, there is something. So SEDS stands for Selective Estrogen Receptor Degrader. Um, but in fact, there is a paper that has been published in Cell by, the Genentech, um, by Genentech. Uh, it's uh, 2019, and they showed that the make true mechanism of action of a third is basically it binds to the ER and then it traps the estrogen receptor on the DNA. And therefore, the estrogen receptor cannot move elsewhere on the DNA, and degradation of the ER is a consequence of this trapping, but it's not mandatory for CERD to be active. So they blocked the proteasome and CERD were still active, so definitely it's more like a trapping activity and uh, degradation is not mandatory. So let's say we 
are no understanding of Sylvestran is working, despite the fact that Sylvestran was approved um, um, more than one decade ago. And we also have a new kind of endocrine therapy, uh, so a PROTAC. And PROTAC, um, so it's an agent that will bind to the ER. There is also a linker, and the third part of the molecule will attract uh, the ubiquitin elation machinery, so it will really lead to ER degradation, and in the absence of ER, therefore, so there is no transcription. So very different mechanism of action between SEM, SED, and PROTAC even though there could be a continuum for some molecules between SEM and CERD. So uh, we have different mechanisms of action, and I think it will really make an impact in terms of efficacy, safety, and biomarkers. So uh, we have many trials that are uh, currently ongoing. So a second line, third line, to make the proof of concept of efficacy as single agent. Then combination with uh, targeted therapy, could be verolimus, abemacitlib, or trastuzumab, pertuzumab. And then we have uh, uh, several uh, first-line trials that are currently ongoing. So far, we have the uh, readout of the three trials here, emerald, which is positive, accelerant negative, and cellular 2 positive, but not registrational. Uh, when it comes to emerald, so the main and only uh, phase three data we have, and it was a global registrational trial, so patients were pretreated with uh, CDK46 inhibitor. It was mandatory, but they could have received a second line of endocrine therapy, and they also may have received a prior line of uh, chemotherapy. We randomized the elastestran versus single agent endocrine therapy. Uh, in terms of patient population, so uh, you see that about 70% of patients had visceral metastasis, and about 40% of patients uh, had received two prior lines of endocrine therapy. So MRL is a second slight third line trial, and about 20% received a prior line of chemo. So in this heavily pretreated population, in the all patient population, so you see that half of patients will progress at two months, really highlighting the need for us to, to be able to distinguish patients that still have, uh, whose tumor is still sensitive to endocrine therapy, whereas just those whose uh, tumor will progress uh, immediately if you re-challenge the tumor with an endocrine therapy. But then after two months, you see a superiority of elastestran versus standard of care. And this was really pronounced in the ESR1 mutant subgroups, so uh, with an hazard ratio that is, was um, about 0.6, so really uh, convincing, and it led uh, to this um, drug approval in Europe and in the US. And here, I think it's a, a Virginia reported it last year, so at San Antonio, it's a very interesting subgroup analysis. So it's a post hoc analysis. So let's say from a, a statistical standpoint, it has very little value, but still I am using it in my clinics like every day, as I was uh, referring before, is that we are uh, combining, so uh, for a patient to be treated with elastestran, the patient must, be, uh, must have an ESA1 mutation detected in blood, but also we are looking at the uh, time on first line with CDK46 inhibitor and using a one, one year as a threshold. So because we are seeing here longer PFS with elastestran given at single agents, and I think that um, median PFS of eight months is very acceptable when it comes to um, single agent um, second line endocrine therapy. Toxicity was easy, we already discussed that point, so I'm gonna skip that. And uh, approval in the US is ESA1 mutant metastatic breast cancer. We have a very similar approval in Europe, but they are also stating that patients must have received a prior CDK46 inhibitor, which is not um, surprising. And in regards to the two other uh, second line trials, so Accelera and Serena2, the bottom line here is that these two other NGCERT confirm the exquisite sensitivity of ESA1 mutant MBC. So if you look at the hazard ratio in the all-comer populations, it could be, let's say, interesting or good, but it's always better when you look at the ESA1 mutant subgroup. So clearly, we have a biomarker that is telling us that these uh, tumors are more sensitive to CERT given as single agent. Um, what are the future challenges uh, in this space? So um, again, we have so far many more trials than um, available results today. So in terms for Elastestran, clearly, now um, it is available in the US, it is available in many European countries as well. So clearly the idea is to implement ESA1 testing and so, uh, so clinicians know when to test for ESA1 using ctDNA, which is kind of new for us. And we also have to work on biomarkers or even clinical markers to predict long PFS. Um, 
about combinations with targeted therapy. The question clearly is, uh, can, can it expand further the survival benefits? Uh, and will this expansion of benefits will be seen in the ESI1 uh, positive population or in all comers? And here for this, I will just um, show you some data uh, reported by Kamal at the last ESMO meeting. It's uh, coming out of a phase one trial, so it's a very small number of patients. But you see with a third that is um, immunostrong here so that you have some responses, uh, but not so many when the third is given as a single agent. But as long as it is combined with Evolimus or Alpelizib, you clearly see that the number of uh, responses is increased, but also the depth of the responses is increased. So, which means Means these cells have a clear potential to be, let's say, the backbone endocrine therapy for combination, keeping in mind that it comes with some toxicity. If you look at grade three tox, you see 20% immunostrong given as single agent, rising to 40% when combined with Everlimus, and up to 80% of grade three events when combined with Alpedisib, which is kind of, um, let's say, high uh, percentage of um, uh, tox. And so we have Sina6, which is a kind of unique, so targeting ESA1 mutation as soon as they appear. So I think it's a very promising trial. I might be biased. And um, there is also all these trials uh, testing uh, this new compound in first line to trying to prevent, basically, the appearance of ESA1 mutation. And maybe we'll get even a higher benefit. We don't know. And just to conclude, so. Um, so far, we are considering all these agents like same class because we don't know exactly, but still, we, they will, these agents will have different toxicities and maybe different biomarkers. Thank you. So I really like those uh, <clears throat> mechanism of action slides in the beginning. I, I learned a lot from that. I'm just trying to figure out, I'm in these trials like <laughs> imlunestrant, plus or minus abema, alpalisib, everlimus, I can't even imagine what the uh, mechanism of that would be, but sounds pretty interesting. Um, so, uh, and this is actually, you were talking about uh, camisestrant, but, and you put the numbers for hazard rate up there. There's two different doses of cami, you know, another sir that has this phase three data. Uh, but the thing I just thought was interesting were the, the looks of the curves. So here's the overall curve, but then when you break it down, on the left is ESR1, on the right, no ESR1. You just visually, you see what it's doing, and you know, hazard, hazard rate of... Uh, you know, 0.33 and point, this is pretty significant anti-tumor activity. All right, so we asked Erica to talk a bit more about uh, ADCs, particularly new ones. And um, again, we asked the faculty, based on what we know, what they thought uh, were the likelihoods of at least two of these uh, new ADCs, Dato, uh, that we just talked about, and then Petritimab targeting HER3. Um, in terms of the types of toxicities. We're going to get a little bit more into it. We also asked the faculty, what are you thinking right now about data? If it were available, uh, how would you think it through? And you, again, you can uh, check these out afterwards and uh, read through them. Of course, a lot of people are thinking about it versus uh, sasituzumab in the IHC uh, zero patients and maybe after uh, sasituzumab. Uh, uh, Eric is also going to talk about patrinumab deruxtecan, a drug also with a lot of activity in lung cancer. We've been talking about it in our lung cancer programs. Really fascinating uh, ADC that looks to be, the thing that's interesting about it is not only is there activity, but HER3 is like all over the place. So many different cancers have HER3, and really interesting. All right, well, this is a couple of words about uh, data, and then we'll uh, let Erica finish out with some more data. Here's Dr. Tarantino. You see a lot of stomatitis, you see some dry eye, you see less ILD with Dato DXD. And so it really speaks to the fact that these ADCs engage the target and the target matters, but it's also the chemo. And so with both agents, you can have alopecia, you can have nausea. So they are different, but not too different. The tropium resto one data presented as more were intriguing and they showed a significant benefit in PFS. We still don't know about OS. I think the major issue here is that we don't have any data in patients that have previously received TDXD. So for the moment, I think I'm not sure I would be using Dato DXD in a patient that received prior TDXD because there is a high risk for cross resistance. And so if I had to choose, I think I would prefer either sasituzumab 
or a different chemotherapy for the moment. Of course, there is no risk here because data DSA is not approved yet, but if it was approved, I don't think I would use it in early lines. Data looks interesting, at least in the ear positive setting. It looks very similar to sasituzumab, but assuming it gets approved at some point, we're going to make the decision on how many times a patient has to come in. It's two times with SASI versus one every three weeks with DATO. And on the toxicity, so DATO's big toxicities seem to be mucositis and this dry eye, which may be keratitis. And, you know, there's obviously humanitis in about three or 4%. They're both TROBE2 and one is SN38 and one is DXD. Obviously, there's something about the oral mucosa that doesn't like DXD delivered at a certain level. But we didn't see that. We didn't see mucositis with trastuzumab drugs TCAN, which is the same DXD payload. So, Kamal, we actually did an entire CME program on ophthalmic complications in oncology. I never thought we were going to be doing that. Uh, but I'm curious about uh, what your thoughts are about what's been said here. Again, we hear this thing about maybe not two ADCs or two ADCs with the same payload in a row. Uh, and also uh, your experience with the mucositis with DATO, how it compares to, say, Everlimus. Yeah, no, uh, excellent point. So let's uh, let's talk about if we see datapotamab get approved at some point, right, for HR positive patients. Um, I agree that, you know, right now if I have a HER2 low positive patient, I'm going to think about TDXD first in that patient population. And I would try and apply the datapotamab for patients I cannot give TDXD to uh, and think about offering datapotamab and sasituzumab to a patient and discuss the side effect profile, the administration schedule, and the nuances of that and, and think about doing that. When we think about the side effect profile, I think uh, Dr. Brubsky was right that we've not seen mucositis with trastuzumab deruxtecan, even though DATO and TDXT both have the same payload. We don't see mucositis with sasituzumab either, even though it is a trope 2 ADC. But at the end of the day, this is not that simple. It's not just a target, just a linker, and just a payload. There are nuances to the, um, the platforms that are utilized. There are nuances to the linker technologies that we have and the cleavability and the hydrolyzability of the linker uh, in the tumor microenvironment, which can sometimes play. We also heard at ESMO a newer um, trope 2 ADC data set from the Merck compound, the SKBR, uh, that was acquired by American presented at ESMO, and there we did see mucositis. Hmm. So there is something with mucositis that we're seeing with trope 2 ADCs. The DAR for datapotamab, the drug to antibody ratio is four for datapotamab. It's eight for TDXD, 7.6 with sasituzumab. So there are differences, even though there are similarities across these payloads. And I think one has to keep those in mind. And with respect to management, I think mucositis, we have seen some benefit, at least in trial use. And my experience with uh, being part of those trials, where it may be triple negative or HR positive, is that the dexamethasone mouthwash has been helpful uh, with respect to lowering the severity and the grade of this mucositis. So this is this will be something which will be very important if and when this gets approved and starts getting utilized, that we're aware of that, we can offer that to our patients, and hopefully that can not come in the way. The ophthalmologic side effects have not necessarily been very high grade in my experience of dealing with them. So um, some dry eyes have been uh, reported out, and you know we do require uh, ophthalmologic exams that were incorporated to uh, assess that. But fortunately, that has been low grade and did not necessarily clinically impact uh, you know, um, the patient population receiving it with respect to severity. Yeah, one of the first uh, ADCs that did that was a drug used in myeloma, belantamabidotin. We're going to talk about it Friday night. Yes. It actually got pulled off the market because the confirmatory trial wasn't positive. Now there's a positive phase three trial. It's probably going to go back. But anyhow, they, had, they were one of the first ones to deal with the ophthalmic issues. The patients were all freaked out, but things settled down and it worked out. So hopefully that'll happen with Dato. So Erica, as a lead in to your talk, I asked Dr. Pegram to comment a bit about pitridumab deruxacan that you're going to talk about, which has a HER3 as a target, interesting uh, target, and also a uh, bispecific. So you're in the bispecific game. That's all we're going to be talking about on Friday is bispecific and CAR-T and everything. Zanidatumab, which is a different kind of bispecific. Anyhow, here's Dr. Uh, Pegram. It's a critical signaling intermediate. There's no question about that. But in the case of HER3 for antibody drug conjugates, it may not matter that much what its signaling attributes are. As long as it's internalized, who cares? If it's on the cell surface and it's internalizable, it's a target, and it may be a very legitimate target, and it may not matter whether it's participating in pathogenesis or not. It might just be along for the ride in pathogenesis, but still have very nice activity. It's quite possible that'll be the case. 
That's the promise of ADCs. What about zanidatumab? It binds to different epitopes on HER2 and is a more potent stimulus for receptor-mediated endocytosis and internalization and has single-agent activity that's very robust, also in early-phase trials still, but incredible efficacy signals. Another class of molecules to keep an eye on is there are new classes of PI3 kinase inhibitors now, particularly those that perturb the RAS PI3 kinase binding interface. And it can lead to PI3 kinase targeting responses in tumors without the side effects of a hyperglycemia, for example. Anything you want to say about what he said before you give your talk? No, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think one of the interesting things about antibody drug conjugates is I feel like we spent at least the past decade, if not longer, subsetting all of these people, ER positive, you know, triple negative, HER2, subsets within that. And now with antibody drug conjugates, we're kind of pushing everybody back together because they have activity across normal divides, right? Exactly. All right, let's take a look at some data. So we're going to start with data potamab deruxtecan. Uh, you know, all of these are coming, so uh, none of these are currently approved now. I would say that uh, data is definitely the closest with uh, positive uh, results from tropian Bresto one um, So Kamal led us into this pretty uh, nicely. This is another TROP2 directed antibody drug conjugate. It has a DAR of uh, four. And again, you see DXD payload. So you can think about this as a trastuzumab deruxtecan, but we're targeting trope 2 instead of targeting HER2 now. So this was uh, pan tumor one I'll go through this pretty quickly, um, but you can see certainly progression-free survival in heavily uh, pretreated patients was about 8.3 months. And this led to the tropian Bresto-1 study that we recently uh, saw data at ESMO. Uh, so these patients were previously treated with one to two prior lines of chemotherapy in the metastatic setting. Uh, they had already progressed on endocrine therapy and were considered endocrine resistant before they went on to receive this chemotherapy. And it was a pretty straightforward design. Dato uh, given every three weeks or uh, investigator choice chemotherapy, good drugs there, aribulin, venerelbine, capecitabine, uh, gemcitabine. You see the breakdown that about two-thirds of patients had had one prior line of chemotherapy and about a third had seen two prior lines of chemotherapy. And this is what we saw. We saw a benefit uh, really right at about two months. And so uh, the dreaded cross-trial comparison that we always caveat but still do um, looks quite similar to our sasituzumab data in terms of our benefit here with progression-free survival. We did see uh, clearly an improved overall response rate, about uh, 36.4 compared to about 22.9 with single agent chemotherapy. Uh, overall survival data uh, clearly uh, was not mature, um, but this is being uh, followed. So when we get into the safety, I think it's tempting to try to classify all these ADCs in one category. We think about tyrosine kinase inhibitors, we know what to expect. It's rash and it's diarrhea. The antibody drug conjugates really are different. And I think, you know, this is becoming clear, obviously, with uh, trastuzumab deruxtecan as well as sasituzumab. Uh, but even across uh, trope 2 antibody drug conjugates, they do have different profiles. Uh, so we do see less ILD. So if you look down here, all grades ILD uh, in, uh, you know, only a small uh, minority of patients, definitely less than uh, what we see from trastuzumab deruxtecan. Um, the ocular vents, I'll caveat this, um, is uh, seeing some gynecologic patients uh, in phase one as well. It, it is different. So, you know, for the gynecologic ADCs, uh, we, you know, really worry about uh, keratopathy, uveitis, it's a corneal. Um, this really is dry eyes. It, you know, they're not, the ophthalmologists don't find anything on exam. They just need some lubricating drops. We're not doing the cold packs or the steroid eye drops or some of the other stuff we're doing. So I agree with Kamal that this is easily managed. Um, like you know about mervituximab? Is it like mervituximab? It is not. No, okay. It, 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 is, it is much easier <laughs> yeah. hmm. than that. Um, so, she knows about GYN. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, to, just enough to be dangerous, right? <laughs> um, so the stomatitis is the concern here. And what's tricky about this study is that um, they, did, you know, they weren't able to capture who received prophylaxis prophylactic dexamethasone mouthwash. Um, it's pretty easy to access in the United States, but in some places it's hard to access that uh, mouthwash. And so we saw, you know, really, um, you know, a, a little over half of our patients uh, having stomatitis. Um, rare to be grade three, 7%, but if you think about stomatitis and having sores in your mouth, you know, grade one is a pretty significant nuisance, and grade two probably means that you're not really wanting to eat and drink very well. Um, so that really, you know, can be quite uh, significant. 
So uh, we also alluded to this. Uh, there was a novel trope two uh, presented. I'll, I'll keep this brief. Um, this is again a, a trope two. It has a DAR of a 7.4, um, and this was also presented uh, at ESMO. We haven't uh, seen this here. So patritumab is the HER3 uh, DXD. Um, so again, DXD, you can think of now, we've got trastuzumab druxtecan, we have uh, DATO DXD, and now HER3 DXD. And what's interesting about HER3 is it's really widely expressed in a variety of tumor types. Uh, HER3 uh, does not have its own kind of kinase activity, um, but highly involved in uh, dimerization with HER2 and downstream uh, signaling pathways. So this is patritumab druxtecan, uh, very uh, similar. We also have a DAR of 8 here, so it has that higher DAR like trastuzumab druxtecan. Uh, this was uh, data that I and Crop initially presented, and what's very interesting, uh, certainly small numbers of patients, uh, HER2 here, but really seeing activity across all three uh, subtypes of breast cancer. And the duration of response for the responders, you know, is pretty long for a phase one trial. Um, you know, 5.5 months in triple negative, where we would anticipate it to be a little bit shorter, but hormone receptor positive, you know, over six months, and HER2 positive uh, really almost hitting uh, one year. We also see a a little bit lower ILD here as well, about 6%, uh, and caveat that to the trastuzumab druxtecan studies that report somewhere between about 12 to 15%, uh, depending on the study. Um, we presented uh, this data. This was Icarus Bresto 1. Uh, Dr. Pastilli uh, presented this. It was a phase 2 trial of HER3 uh, DXD. Um, again, single arm, only about 50 patients, but you see uh, about a quarter of patients having uh, objective responses and uh, another half of patients uh, having stable disease here. Um, pretty heavily pretreated two uh, prior uh, regimens. What's interesting in the top right here is HER3 expression is, is pretty high. So uh, patients having greater than 75% uh, with IHC uh, is upwards of half. So this was a, a phase two trial that we uh, presented earlier this year at ASCO and enrolled both hormone receptor positive as well as triple negative. Um, hormone receptor positive had to exhaust their endocrine therapies, no more than two prior chemos. Triple negative allowed one to three prior chemos. Median number of priors was three. Um, and what we were really trying to get at is, is this an ADC where we need to determine a HER3 expression to see who may respond? And in fact, we didn't see that at all. Um, very small numbers of patients that had less than 25% expression, which is reassuring because it's highly expressed. Um, but we had response rates, you know, 50% there and certainly didn't appear that uh, our patients that had greater than 75% did any better than 25 uh, to 75% either. So you can see response rate is about a third of patients, clinical benefit rate uh, 43%, and duration of response of at least six months, um, half of those patients. Uh, so uh, pretty, pretty encouraging data in this setting. Uh, this was the waterfall plot, so you can see a lot of these patients were actually getting meaningful shrinkage uh, in this setting. Over on the right, broken out by hormone receptor positive in blue and triple negative in yellow. And so um, we're now looking uh, at this really kind of asking the question of sequencing. Um, I think, you know, we have good ADCs that are now approved. And so um, all of the patients that we're enrolling now in expansion are patients that are already post ADC, uh, really to look at the activity of this uh, post other antibody drug conjugates. Um, this is another HER3 ADC, just to be complete. Uh, there had a first in human trial, um, had about a 25% response rate. Interestingly, the side effect of this tend to be uh, very uh, heme-based with anemia, neutropenia, and also having uh, some nausea. So, and then uh, briefly, I'm not going to go through this slide, uh, but other uh, novel agents, uh, the PROTAC, which has been touched on multiple times today, uh, Sarah Hurwitz is presenting uh, the final data from the Veritac trial. Um, I'm actually presenting the combination data with palbociclib, and, and I think this drug is a little bit different than SIRDS and may have some advantages in uh, certain patient populations. Uh, we also have the CRAN, which is a complete estrogen receptor antagonist that blocks both um, AF1 as well as AF2, uh, and then you can see a variety of other uh, endocrine agents that are in development as well. So uh, just a couple more things. Uh, Hope, really interesting. Sounds like real case from the audience. Maybe you can help people out, somebody here. 85-year-old woman with T4, N0, M0, ER positive, HER2 negative, medically not a candidate for surgery or chemo. Doesn't say why. What's your opinion for endocrine therapy? 
just, you know, off the top of your head. <laughs> Well, you know, some of this depends. I mean, T4 means that she has an inflammatory breast cancer, presumably. Uh, and uh, so those often are quite high grade uh, and can be difficult to treat. But some, for some of these older patients, it's a neglected tumor. And I think the fact that she's N0 suggests that potentially this is more of a neglected tumor than a really high grade, fast growing tumor like we see in younger women. So I would treat this patient, I had a patient just like this, except for she hadn't paid her taxes for 10 years, which is a little bit of a problem getting compassionate use drug, but we fixed that. Uh, but he, <laughs> You know, she, the, what we gave the patient was an AI and palbociclib. Actually, we got free palbociclib for that patient, which is why. But I would probably start with something like that. In a patient who's 85, I might use palbo instead of a BAM. I'm worried about the diarrhea and dehydration and ribo. I'm worried about some of the cardiac issues in a patient who might not have had good medical care. So I, um, and in 85, I'm not trying to have her live forever. So that's what I would start. We had fabulous response in this one patient who had a neglected tumor. Uh, and she's still on her therapy now, three years later. So, One thing I've learned in the years working with Dr. Rugo is no matter what case you present to her, it's gonna, the answer is going to start out. I just saw a patient like this last <laughs> week. So final a comment uh, from Virginia. I was just flashing on the fact, Virginia, that I had this memory of being a fellow at the University of Miami, and my attending, Chuck Vogel, who said, we're starting this program uh, in San Antonio next week, you wanna go? <clears throat> and what I realized is, every singular since then, except of course the pandemic, I've been in this hotel. Oh my <laughs> every <God>. single year, <laughs> this hotel. Anyhow, can you give us a quick brief, uh, what, your point, what your thoughts are, Virginia, about the best, most interesting, provocative, discussed papers of the week? I think there's going to be a lot of good local therapy papers, and we've obviously talked about the metastatic trials and the new drugs, and those are exciting, but when trying to avoid doing axillary node dissections, when trying to avoid giving a lot of radiation to low-risk tumors, I think that's where a lot of the impact this week is going to come. So it's exciting to see some of our local therapy colleagues really performing high-impact trials. That's great. You know, you see more and more in oncology about de-escalation in general, all parts of oncology. So thanks so much to the faculty on the stage. Thanks to the faculty that worked with me to prepare this. Thank you for attending. I'll come back tomorrow night.